Welcome everyone to this webinar on writing toward the acquisition of respectful interculturality. My name is Cecile Lene. I am Adriana Ramirez. My name is Christy Lentz. And we are going to start this preview. It's a preview. It's a preview for a book that contains a lot more detail about writing toward the acquisition of respectful interculturality. And it's important to mention that this book is not for profit. Uh, we are here because we love our profession and we love our word language teachers. And we have some ideas um, about how to write for the acquisition of respectful interculturality. So we will start with a round of introductions and then we will go through a presentation. So Christy will get us started. So hello, my name is Christy Lentz. I'm calling in from Northern California, way out in the woods. And I'm actually a transplant to Northern California. I started teaching in rural, rural suburban Washington state in the early 2000s. And at that point in time, most of my students all shared my same demographic, um, mostly white, mostly middle class students. And throughout my journey as a Spanish teacher, I started incorporating a lot of storytelling into my class. And when I started teaching with comprehensible input, in 2015, I bought all the novels, I was very excited, and very rarely did anybody in that context ever question my practices. So I thought they were pretty great. And in 2016, I did an early retirement, so to speak, from teaching because I wanted to go back to graduate school in intercultural studies. So I moved to the Bay Area of California, specifically Berkeley, and I only stopped teaching for about six months because I love Spanish so much that I couldn't stay away. So I started going to grad school half time, teaching Spanish half time. And in the Bay Area, my student population was very different from my student population in rural suburban Washington State. And I started to notice a pattern of consistent discomfort with my materials and practices, specifically my language learner novels among my students and their parents and community members. So it really started me on a journey of starting to think about what was going on and how we might be able to reflect on our materials and practices in a different way. So fast forward three and a half years, I had some ideas, I had experimented with some of them and as my background is in writing nonfiction, as you can imagine, as a graduate student. I brought these ideas to two friends who are fiction writers to say, are these, what do you guys think? Are these, are these valid? Are these worth sharing more widely within the profession that I love so much? And they said, well, we love these. So I, I brought to them four ideas and we scrapped one. And of those three, we expanded it to be nine different models. And that's probably just the start because within our community, we'll probably end up with, with many more models as well. So that is how this project came about. And I'm sure that if I left out anything in that story that Cecil and Adriana will, will fill in what was missed. So turning this now to Cecil. I am Cecil Linné and I'm a French American teacher. I teach French in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, two years ago, I was teaching at an all girls school. And when I was reviewing the language learner readers that I had um, looking for a story with a strong female character, I could not find any. So my students and I wrote a story about a strong girl who kicks. Uh, her name is Alice. And that turned into a book. And that was my first book. After writing that first book, Alice, uh, several teachers and students um, asked me if I was going to write a sequel um, specifically with uh, Bilal as the main character. Bilal in the book Alice was um, Alice's crush um, and uh, he is a French Algerian teenager. And I had an hesitation. I, in fact, I, I felt uncomfortable uh, writing Bilal's story but I didn't really know why, so I just moved on and wrote about another friend of Alice's, which is uh, Kadha, and then another friend with Camille. 
And at the end of the three books, people kept asking, so now you have to write about Bilal, right? Because you've written about all of Alice's friends and he's the only one left. And uh, I started digging deeper and I realized I just do not have it in me to write in the voice of a French Algerian teenage boy. I was, I felt very deeply connected to the experience of a teenage girl in the south of France, because that was my experience. Um, <clears throat> but I just didn't feel I was uncomfortable writing from that other perspective. So I decided to end the trilogy with just the three girls and not write about Bilal. And right around that time, Christy got in touch with me and started sharing some of her ideas. And I joined the project and I've learned so much and I've grown so much as a white author. And I'm pleased to say that actually there is a future for Bilal's story, thanks to the wonderful ideas that we uh, talked about and brainstormed with the Staying in Our Lanes project. And now on to Adriana. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, I am from Colombia, originally from Colombia, and I moved to Canada 11 years ago. I live in the Vancouver area in Canada. So when I came here and I started buying my uh, CI readers, I got them all the ones that we could buy at that time. And something happened. Something happened that I could not put words into at that time, just feelings. And after years of elaborating those feelings, I was able to put words into what I was going through. So instead of feeling proud of teaching Spanish, which is my mother tongue, is instead of like uplifting me and my culture, I felt the opposite. I, I used the books, I used them in class, I taught with them, but every time I used them, I felt less and less and less. So up, up to a point without even knowing why, I just couldn't keep using them. I put them away and then I decided to write because I was tired of these stereotypes these ways of representing us that those books were perpetuating. And they were very similar in like in book after book after book. So I started to write because I wanted to show the world our st stories from the inside. My stories are from Colombia and I wanted to show the world stories written by a Colombian, stories that only a Colombian can share with the world. And that's why I started writing because I wanted to share with other people, teachers and students, a, like a way, a different way of seeing my people and my country. Um, so a lot of us um, have, this is not new, a lot of us have been talking about this all, already for years. There's been um, feelings of um, feeling uncomfortable with some stereotypes, some plots, some books. So this is not new. The thing is that for us, um, I'm going to speak for for, Colum for Colombians in general. Of course, you might find an exception, but generally Colombians and Latinos, we are raised um, with this idea. It's so ingrained in us that sometimes we cannot even put it into words that everything European, everything North American, everything white is better. And, and we just take it and accept it. Um, so for us, it's really hard to call people out for us is really hard to say that we don't like this or this is not okay or this is not appropriate. It's not in us. We have to do the work to be able to put those words out. So it's not easy. But so what I'm saying is because these feelings have been out, the, out there and between us Latino teachers, we've shared them. We just haven't done anything explicitly to share them with the world because it's, it's just hard for us. So we have this word that we use a lot in Latin America that is praxis. And praxis means theory, reflection, and action. So there is a lot of theory. There are a lot of researchers and scholars that have been talking about this for years already in Latin America. Paulo Freire, Enrique Dussel, Eduardo Galeano. So there is plenty of that. We've been doing a lot of reflection and thinking, and eventually we have, we have to start com complaining and we have to take action and do something about it. So, um, that's that's uh, my introduction and that's why I ended up here because I want to provide with something, I wanna help with something. And then I met Cecile and Christy and we were on the same wave and we it was just fantastic. 
So that's my introduction and then I'm ready to start introducing the, the project. So we are educators and as such, we have to hold ourselves accountable with our practices. Are we supporting the status quo? or are we challenging it? A lot of our literature is perpetuating the status quo and the relationship of power we have with colonized countries. Yes, this project causes discomfort and this is a reaction that we were expecting. When we challenge the status quo, those that have been beneficiaries of it will feel uncomfortable. Call out this, calling out disrespectful practices causes defensiveness, and this is a tenet of white supremacy culture. Stories are very important because they build the narratives of the people who those stories belong to. The stories that we choose to tell about a culture that is not ours are building the narrative of that culture in our students' heads. So with that being said, we're ready to start sharing our project with you. And as we hop into the project, a few things to note. Adriana mentioned that sometimes this project can provoke a bit of discomfort for people. And we just wanna set people's minds at ease before we go into this on a few different things. And the first is that in this entire project, whenever we mention any individual authors or any individual works, it is only to uplift. There's no um, disparaging or put down sorts of comments anywhere in this. Again, our, our whole intention is to uplift. The second thing is that we want to take very much into consideration our point in history. We're recording this in 2020. You might be watching this in a future year, but at this point in time in 2020, we're at a real aperture of new opportunities that are available to us through Zoom calls, through the kinds of uh, collaborations that can happen across cultures because of technology. So when we're talking about literature in our field, we want to take into account that 15, 17 years ago, that was a time in which if we were going to be a bridge or we, we thought that we needed to be a bridge and that in doing so, we ended up projecting our lenses onto other people. There weren't as many possibilities for communication, but now there are. So this is really a call for us to, now that we know better, to do better with the year 2020 and what's available to us. The third thing that we want to say just to set anyone's mind at ease if they're feeling a bit of discomfort right now is that we are situating this this project within a growth mindset we want to look at things on a spectrum of less respectful to more respectful and that we're all on a process of growth along that spectrum and finally if there are points of discomfort that arise during the presentation or perhaps later when you're reading the book that's being published we would encourage everyone to lean into that discomfort with curiosity to sit with the discomfort and to see what new insights it might lead to. With those thoughts, let's hop into the first slide of our presentation with some definitions. The first definition is on voices work. On voices work is when an author and a protagonist of the work share a marginalized identity. So there's no such thing as an on voices author but it, there is on voices works. An author can write about a protagonist with whom he shares, he or she shares um, a marginalized identity, and that would be considered an on voices work. And then that same author can write, is maybe writing about a protagonist with whom they don't share uh, a marginalized identity, and that would not be considered on voices work. So that's an important distinction here. The second definition is one that we are all familiar with in the world language community, TL, for target language being taught and being studied. And with that comes the term TC, a particular target culture that speaks to target language and is being represented. And for this, the work that we're doing today and for our preview of the book, um, we refer to TC as target culture 
that are used in various books. But we also talk about culture that can include subcultures and intersectional identities. MTC, therefore, is members of a particular target culture. And you might wonder, what does it mean to be a member of a target culture? Uh, it's both way, it's a two-way relationship. Um, you have to identify with a particular target culture and the members of that tar target culture also need to uh, include you and recognize you as a member. And so that can get tricky sometimes. I am a French um, citizen. Um, I identify as French and my, you know, my French um, counterparts over in France also identify me as French. Um, I am also an American citizen. Um, I got my citizenship in 2012. So I do feel like I am a member of um, the American culture, the United States. Um, and some members of the United States do recognize me as American and others don't. Um, so that can be definitely something that is, um, that is nuanced and, and tricky. And not an MTC, non-members of a particular target culture is exactly what it says. And Christy, you want to say something Cecil, about this? Sure, yeah. That, as Cecil is saying that being a member of a target culture and a non-member of a target culture can be overlapping identities. There's a really big space in between where things are not always quite so clearly cut. A few things also that we want to mention is membership, it's, it's not citizenship, it's more of an emotional identification with a culture and that that emotional identification which can go deeper than sometimes it looks on the outside is something that can also include ancestral heritage. There is a scholar by the name of Ramon Grossvogel. He is Puerto Rican, living in the United States. He's Puerto Rican American, um, living in my backyard in Berkeley. And he's written a work that talks about the four genocides and epistemicides, killing off of knowledge, of what he calls the long 16th century. The four genocides that he identifies are the burning of women as witches in Europe, the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from particularly the area known as Spain, but other areas as well, the enslavement of Africans, the forced enslavement, and the genocide of indigenous Americans, of course, American referring to South, Central, and North America. What he makes a point to emphasize in that article is that it was not just genocide, but epistemicide, the killing off of knowledge. And today, when members of a culture are reclaiming the ancestral knowledge of their people from generations ago, when that sort of ancestral reclamation is happening, that is also being a member of a target culture. And that's really important to emphasize from a perspective of decolonization. So again, being a member or a non-member of a target culture is, is a complex thing and ancestral heritage is included in membership. Thank you, Christy, and thank you for clarifying that it goes way beyond citizenship. I appreciate that so much. So, um, why do we propose these models for writing? Because even with the best intentions, not members of a target culture authors can Tell stories that should not be told. And there are some stories that when you are an outsider, you listen to the story, you hear the story, and you think it's pretty, pretty cool, and you want to share it with everyone, but you don't know how that story is affecting the people from the culture, the pain that can cause, the wounds that can open, and some stories should not be told. And if they're going to be told, they should be told by the members of that community. But if you don't belong to the community, you don't know. This is especially, um, Dr. Debbie Ruiz talks about this, especially around uh, First Nations uh, people. There are some stories that are theirs to tell and not up from outsiders to tell. I can also talk about it from my own experience. Uh, I am from Medellin, Colombia, and we've gone through a lot of like really difficult times in our history. I lived through them 
And there are some stories that I don't want people telling people from my outside of my community. I don't want them telling the stories because they are very painful. And when we are ready to tell them, we choose when. And it's part, when you are part of that culture that suffered, when you tell that story, it becomes part of your healing process of processing your pain through the story. So that's why it's really, really important to respect those stories. Uh, the second point, so even with the best intentions, not members of the target culture authors can perpetuate the colonization and looting of the cultures they are writing about. And we have two authors here that have worked in depth with this topic, um, especially if you come from a colonized, oppressed country, territory, like Latin America and Africa. We have been looted for 500 years. It was the gold, the silver, um, our people, everything, everything, absolutely everything, our knowledge, our stories, our spirituality. And now the looting keeps happening in so many ways, but also in the form of stories. So uh, we see this trend of like Hollywood and, and big companies going, shopping for stories like, oh, this is cool. They, this could sell. Extracting the story and telling the stories with their own lenses, not respecting the people that the story belongs to. So we don't want to perpetuate the looting of the stories between the traditionally like colonizers and the colonized people. And the last point, uh, even with the best intentions, not members of the target culture authors can reinforce harmful stereotypes about the target cultures and its people because they don't, they're not insiders. They, without knowing, they might reinforce those stereotypes. And we don't, we don't want to do that. We want to move away from that. So Adrienne is talking about the things that can happen even with the best intentions. And we want to also mention some things that just as a matter of course will happen. And as we bring these up, we also wanna mention that there is of course that difference between intent and impact that we might have the very best intentions, but regardless, this ends up being the impact that non-member of a target culture authors will, as a matter of course, look at and filter stories through their own lenses. Many psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists are showing that we have a mindset that has been formed in us in our very earliest years and the culture that we spent those early years. And that we have categories connected to language that we cannot simply lift out into another culture. So regardless of how hard I try, I am going to, to filter somebody else's subjective experience through my own subjective lenses. Another thing that will happen is that we will end up simplifying, generalizing, or misrepresenting a particular target culture and its people. And again, sometimes we may think that the way we see things is pretty universal and we're gonna end up misrepresenting the particulars of another culture. We will run the risk of telling a single story. It is a significant risk. And Chimamanda, I am not gonna say her last name because I don't want to say it improperly. She has the famous TED talk from 2009 in which she talks about telling a single story. She talks about her own experience of growing up reading literature that was produced primarily in England. And that in her mind, that ended up being the, the primary way of seeing the world, but it didn't line up with her own experience. And then she noticed the ways in which she was telling a single story about other people from within her uh, her particular subculture. Strongly recommend listening to this talk if, if you've not already heard it. Again, it's called The Danger of a Single Story. So these things will happen even with the best intentions. And that is why we are proposing these models for writing. And we do wanna mention as well that this is um, a very large conversation happening in so many realms right now. It's happening in the realm of literature. It's very much happening in our world language teacher realm. And so we're very excited to get to add these models to this conversation as some, some pathways that we might explore together. 
So here we are. We are about to start our journey through four different paths. And you, as an author, may choose your own adventure. You may choose one path or you may choose multiple paths. And it really all depends on what your aspirations as an author are. So path A <clears throat> is for word language authors who seek to write a story about their own subcultures from their own perspectives and to write about common themes that could take place in nearly any culture. And we're going to give you some examples. And as Christy said at the beginning of the presentation, we are here to uplift works that are on the more respectful part of the spectrum. So two great examples of stories about common themes that unite us are Brendan Brown wants a dog um, a lot of st our students can identify with wanting a pet, um, seeing pets at the park and, uh, and that experience. Um, and this is set in everyday life. This is something that can happen in nearly every culture. And the second example is La Clase de Confesiones, um, which is the story of a black teen falling in love in a high school setting with a very creepy Spanish teacher who is trying to play matchmaker. And my students absolutely adore that story because they see themselves, they, they see the drama, even if it's over the top, and they've recognized themselves and their experiences in the book. So those are two examples of stories that really are rooted in common things that unite us, and that is path A. There is a second, um, inside the path A, there's a second way of, of writing stories. And as we mentioned, to write about your own subcultures uh, from your own perspective. And an example of that is a book that I wrote called Camille. Um, as you can see on the cover, Camille is a white teenage girl and she's French and she dances, but she doesn't have the stereotypical uh, body of a ballerina dancer. She has thick thighs and, and, uh, and a behind and she has breasts and she has a curvy body. And that teenage girl is, is me. I grew up dancing um, with this body and I was um, often shamed for this body even within my own family. And I, that didn't stop me from dancing and from you know having the joy uh, of listening to the music and losing myself in movements. Um, so I decided to write uh, a story about that. And that's really my unique perspective. We do wanna to mention too, that if there is a marginalized identi identity that you identify with, whether it's an overt identity or a more concealed identity, either way, that if you choose to write from that particular perspective, then you'll be providing much needed uh, literature within the hashtag own voices movement from your own subcultural context. Our students really need that kind of literature as mirrors in which to see themselves and windows in which to better understand with empathy the experiences of others. So that is path A and Christy is now going to take us through path B. So path A was about writing your own stories and path B is very similar to path A because in many of these models, it is writing your own story, but it's also collaborating with someone else who can share their story and then presenting those works together. So path A is for world language authors who seek to collaborate with voices from target cultures. It's for authors who seek creative authorial engagement, and it's for world language authors who seek a finished product in their name. So in Path B, our first model is fair thematic books. So you want to write a book about a shared theme, an own voices person, an own voices author writes about that thing from their culture and you write about that thing from your culture. 
Uh, we couldn't think at this moment when we're recording of an example that already exists of this model. So something that we were thinking brainstorming is, um, for example, I have a book about coffee from Colombia and fair trade coffee from Colombia. And then I would love to have something similar of like fair trade and growing something. And I was talking to someone and she said, she has experience with uh, growing grapes in the Napa Valley. So if she writes something from her experience, her culture, her, her voice of the fair trade grapes in California, in the Napa Valley, then we can pair under the fair trade theme with my coffee book. And it would be fantastic for students to see the same movement of fair trade, how it works in two different contexts and cultures. So something like that would be beautiful. You're writing from your own voice. The own voice author is writing from the voice and you're sharing themes. Similar to what Adriana is talking about, but a step closer of collaboration is to alternate verse, voices in a single book. And again, we, don't, we could not think at this point in time of an example within uh, the realm of language learner literature. So we pulled from young adult literature. This was published in the late 90s by Paula Danziger and Anne M. Martin called P.S. Longer Letter Later. And if you're not familiar with this book, the structure is that each author inhabits the voice of a different character. And these two characters are pen pals. So each chapter of the book is written by a different author. They're alternating. So Paula writes, Anne writes, Paula writes, Anne writes, and as they write, we're seeing those two different voices of two different characters talking with each other. And again, each author is that one character's voice. So in the world language world, it would be really cool to have books with maybe a chapter written from suburban Washington state, and then maybe Argentina, some, some location in Argentina, and alternating those two voices throughout a book. So it's a closer collaboration than Model B1. And then Model B3 co-writing takes it to an cl even closer collaboration because now it's not alternating chapters. Now the whole book, it's a whole collaboration, a writing together between uh, a white author and a non-white author and they're writing close collaborating together, crafting the same text, respecting their perspectives and their voices within the same text. It's a, it's a deep collaboration, it's more complicated, requires a lot of time, probably some fighting because you're, you're crafting your own book and it's gonna be the baby of everyone who is part of the process. Um, both names appear on the cover, both names own the work, it's their baby. Um, we have like white authors, I, I want to say this, white authors have to be careful with any white saviorism that can come across during this process. Um, it has to be a very healthy relationship in which you respect each other's perspectives. Yeah, Adriana, and you know, um, as I was working with you and Christy on this project, that's when I, I had a light bulb um, moment. If you remember, I told you about Bilal, this um, French Algerian teenage boy in the south of France, who was one of my secondary characters in my first book. And people kept asking me, we want to hear a story. We want to hear a story. And I just couldn't. And thanks to this project, I was able to put a name to my discomfort, which was I was I would really, you know, um, not be honoring own voices if I was the one writing this book. And I do see now that this model, model B3 of co-writing, is the path forward for me uh, if I want Bilal's story to, to be told, to be created, to be invented. And so I actually I got in touch with a colleague who shares um, the same culture as my character, Bilal. And I asked him, um, I know he likes to write, and I asked him if he would be interested in, uh, in writing Bilal's story. And so he would be writing from the perspective of Bilal because he's a man and he has the same culture as, as Bilal, um, the North African culture and Muslim culture. 
And then I would be writing from the perspective of being in the south of France, which is where I grew up. And obviously the, the girls that, um, that, that are friends with Bilal from that perspective. And so he has agreed to do this book with me. I'm really excited. I don't know when it will happen. Um, I don't know if it will happen, but I'm just really happy and, and relieved that this project has, has opened so many avenues for stories to be told in a very respectful and collaborative way. The fourth model, there are lots of models under this path, um, is an adaptation to simplified language. And you probably recognize the cover of this book, Le Petit Prince, uh, which is uh, a work that is in the public domain. And what the Stories First Foundation has done is they've taken the work <clears throat> and they've adapted it to simplified French. And as you can see on the cover, um, they've kept the original title, Le Petit Prince. They've given credit to um, the original author, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And then they wrote, uh, adapted in simple French by the Stories First Foundation. And another example of that in the, in the Spanish realm is the Don Quixote, El Ultimo Caballero the, from Karen Rowan, who adapted it from Miguel de Cervantes. So again, the adaptation is only from a language perspective. So you take the text and you make it more comprehensible for our world language students before. I want to add on this one as well that there are a lot of ethical considerations for this adaptation so that in order to prevent us from filtering another cultural perspective through our own cultural lenses, there are a lot of things to consider and we would urge everybody to get a copy of the book in which this question is explored in much more depth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. B5 is the co-production of a graphic novel. As you know, um, our students love graphic novels. And at home, my daughter is a sixth grader and she absolutely devours um, graphic novels. And she came to me with this title, When Stars Are Scattered, telling me, I think you're going to love this book. And when I saw the names on the cover and I read the story, I was, I was just, I had to know more. And by finding more, I realized, oh my gosh, this is, this is a model for, for our paths. Omar Mohammed uh, grew up in a refugee camp um, in Kenya. And he was one of the very few refugees in this camp, he and his brother, to be resettled in the United States. And when he uh, arrived in the United States, he looked for an author, an American author, to help him tell his story. He met uh, Victoria Jemison, who is a uh, graphic novelist for children, and my daughter loves her, her books. And she told him, I don't write for adults, I write for children. This is what I do. This is, this is my gift. And the, this collaboration started. Um, and it was a very close collaboration. Again, this path is you have to collaborate, white author, non-white author, collaborate closely together. So Omar Mohammed told his story to Victoria Jemison and she took copious notes and then she put the notes into the form of a storyboard and then went back to him to check that she had indeed his story the way he wanted to tell the story. And they went back and forth, back and forth with the the storyboard under the guidance of, uh, of Mohammed. And, um, and then they brought in a colorist who did all the coloring for the book. And the result is amazing and I highly recommend this book. And I would love to see these kinds of graphic novels in our word language classrooms. So that was path B, which is all about collaboration. Path C is for world language authors who seek to use their skill set to equip new authors from the target cultures. It's also for world language authors who, ser who seek to serve behind the scenes. So we should be really clear that on path A and B, your name is on the story if you're the author. In path C, 
your name is not on the cover. This is entirely behind the scenes. So the first example of this model C1 would be ghostwriting. And ghostwriting happens so much. Like if we stop and think about it, it happens all around us, but we just generally don't know about it because it's done well. Whether it be political campaigns or famous people writing their autobiographies, very often it is that person writing the story for them, but it's the famous person with their name on it. I can give an example on this that I have a family member. I'm not going to share too many details because I don't want to give away um, this person's location in case this project does happen. But I have a family member who is from an unspecified location in South America, and he has a lot of stories to tell. He does not identify as a writer. He doesn't have much desire to write, but he does have stories that he'd like to tell. At some point, he may wish to tell those, and it may be me or another family member who ends up being his ghostwriter. I do want to say that if that does happen, I am going to suggest to him first that he reach out to someone who is from his own um, background culture, who's going to share more of his conceptual categories. And I'm going to say, would you maybe rather have that person do the ghostwriting? But if he says, no, you're the one that I have this close trusting relationship with, then I would accept that to be the ghostwriter. But again, no one will know because it will be his name on it. Um, so again, it would be entirely behind the scenes. And I should mention here that there are, as before, there's a number of ethical considerations about ghostwriting, particularly about power and how that gets shared. And again, we would really encourage people to read the book before um, embarking on these paths because there, there's a number of things to consider. Another, uh, another option within Path C is one that, um, one that Cecile's gonna tell us about. Um, model C2 is consultation, <clears throat> where you use your skills to equip a new author to create a story. So for example, um, someone got in touch with me, um, an author of color who is not a CI teacher um, but wants to write um, comprehensible uh, books and he's asked if I would be willing to help him achieve that and I, I love simplifying texts I mean that's I live for that that's what I do on a daily basis and I do consider it a skill so whether you're using you know Swiss 16 high frequency words or um, sample text to demonstrate what text complexity <coughs> excuse me text complexity looks like at different different proficiency levels. Um, I'm going to be helping him produce his novel behind the scene. My name doesn't go on the cover. Um, and I'm just here to make sure we have more and more uh, on voices work. So this was path C, which is facilitation, uh, facilitation behind the scene. And now to path D. So path D is also a route that is behind the scenes. And this one is really ideal for people who might want to participate in the creation of new printed story materials, but who might not yet identify as an author, who might not yet feel equipped to be able to have the skill set to facilitate a new work um, as path C would be. So path D is for world language teachers and authors who seek to assist members of the target language and target cultures in giving birth to their own stories. And again, it is entirely behind the scenes. I can speak from personal experience on this path that this is a path that I chose to embark on last summer. I was placed in a situation in which I was in a community of 15 teenage girls and the community asked me to do a project. And I said, well, I would be very interested in story creation if, if the girls are interested. And two girls immediately came forward and said, yes, I have a manuscript. I would really like to turn this into a story. And I said, great, um, what's holding you back? Do you wanna type it out? And they said, well, we don't really have skills in typing. In fact, um, we don't have access to computers. And I said, okay, so you know, what would it take to do that? And they said, well, we want to produce our stories now. So could you type for us? 
So in that situation, I then served as their scribe, transferring their, their uh, written manuscripts to a Word document. And then it was a very interesting process of accompaniment because each writer then sat beside me. I typed and then they would read as their words popped up on the screen and they made all the revisions. It's a very lengthy and very interesting process of each writer saying, yeah, let's add this, cut this out, etc." And when they were done, this work was entirely their voice, mediated through my fingers, but it, it's completely all theirs. It was interesting because as these two girls started to do this, other girls came forth and said, hey, I want to write stories too. So we ended up with a lot of, a lot of people writing new and original stories and going through the same process. In addition, there were also students, it was students and girls together in this, this community who said, I don't want to write my story on paper, but I do want to say it. So then they would dictate their stories as I scribed what they dictated. So it's important to note that in this process, the words can be spoken or handwritten, but the most important thing is that those words are unaltered. It's not my voice. It is entirely their voice. Um, any listeners like myself with a background in early literacy might recognize this strategy as the language experience approach, which is also known as dictated stories. It's been a staple of early literacy classrooms for a long time, and it's being used, similar things are being used in a lot of world language classrooms at upper levels as well. It is important to note that the stories that the storytellers, the authors, produce, there are no strings attached that these stories will ever reach an audience of language learners. If someone produces a story and wants for their work to reach language learners in a different cultural context, that's great. They then can work, they can collaborate on path B or potentially work with someone who wants to do path C to adapt it. But if you choose to do this model, I found in my experience that it was really important to completely release any desire that these stories would reach a language learner audience. And some of the writers did say, yes, please, Christy, I want this to um, go into path C or B, and others said no. I thought I wanted that, but now that I've produced my work, it is so intimate and personal that I just want it for me. And that is completely a valid option either way. I do want to mention in this, um, having worked through this process and now been reflecting on it for about a year, there are some things to be really careful about with regard to the ethics of it. Um, a couple themes are white saviorism. It's really important to be on guard about that if you're doing this. And the other thing is that the person who's in that role as scribe, it really would be good for that person to be from the same or similar culture to the person who's doing their writing. And as with the other paths, those considerations are written about in a lot of detail in the book. So you know what I'm gonna say, we encourage you to read the book. <laughs> So that is path D. We did want to give you a note about the use of cultural consultants and sensitivity readers. They are two very distinct roles. A cultural consultant is a member of the culture or cultures, target cultures that are represented in your, in your book. The cultural consultant has firsthand knowledge and expertise about the cultures their cultural products, practices, and perspectives. So they read the unfinished manuscripts with the specific purpose of ensuring accurate descriptions and illustrations of products, practices, and perspectives. Uh, for example, in my second book, Cadra, um, there is a, a, a chapter on the end of Ramadan. Uh, there's a large Muslim population in France and so a whole chapter talks about the end of Ramadan and how that's being celebrated. Um, with the knowledge that I have today, I would have, ha I would have consulted with someone who actually could have written that chapter. Back then, I didn't know that path B existed. So, you know, once you know better, you do better. Back then, I didn't know, but I did ask a cultural consultant to look at the work and to make sure that I was accurately representing this particular cultural um, practice, which is the end of Ramadan. 
So that cultural consultants are extremely helpful. And they don't just say, yes, that's fine, you're good to go. They really give you critical feedback on the accuracy of the product or the practice or the perspective as you're describing it. The sensitivity reader though is doing something quite different and it, it sometimes is not the same person as your cultural consultant. So your cultural consultant was the expert in the culture, right? The sensitivity reader might not even be from that culture. The sensitivity reader has skills to read an unpublished manuscript specifically for the purpose of finding those misrepresentations, bias, stereotypes, etc. Um, so for example, uh, in my first book, Alice, uh, I mentioned that I had Bilal, this French Algerian uh, teenage boy as a secondary character. France is a very diverse country, so there's a diverse group of friends in the book. And at some point in the book, Alice, there is um, uh, a racially motivated incident that happens to Bilal. And for that particular piece in the book, I wanted to make sure um, that I was actually representing the incident. I had observed this incident as a white person growing up in France, but I had never been the subject of the racially motivated uh, slur. So I, I consulted with a sensitivity reader and uh, asked her to help me with that particular piece and her feedback was really, really interesting and important. So the sensitivity reader, again, may not be from the target culture. In this case, um, she was a woman, she was not a, a man and she was not French Algerian, but she had the experience of growing up uh, a, brown, a brown person in France um, and having some of those uh, racially motivated things happen to her. So she's awake, well, the sensitivity reader is awake to disrupting dynamics of oppression and colonization. And the sensitivity reader is not gonna give you sugar-coated feedback. It's gonna give you critical feedback. And we want, want to sorry. We want to, uh, want to, so ideally you are not writing stories that do not belong to you. So you're writing stories that belong to you, your own culture, your own experiences. So even with your own stories, we recommend that you have a cultural consultant for your own culture and a sensitivity reader for your own culture. Uh, every like My stories are in Colombia. And even though I am from Colombia, I usually have three, four cultural consultants from Colombia. And it's my culture. I was born and I grew up there, but still every one of them gives me a good layer of feedback. So it's, this is very valuable. So imagine I've received this feedback from my own culture. So these are the risks that we want to avoid when you write from, from outside. Um, and something that we've seen is that when you write from outside, we, which we want to avoid, is that people say, my friend said yes. I asked my friend and he said yes. And that's a, that's a risk. That's something that, um, we want to avoid because sometimes our friends do not, they cannot be blunt with us. Um, and like Cecile said, a sensitivity reader is someone that has the skills. It doesn't have to be from that culture or not. It's someone that has worked on seeing things. And it's, it's about so many biases and stereotypes that we sometimes have without knowing. So it's good to have someone from the outside pointing it out to us. So as we move toward the close of this presentation, we want to put forth some thoughts about a call for transparency and accountability. And these are things that our team is working on and that we see happening in so many places in our world language profession right now. So this is just an encouragement for us all to continue in our journey of transparency. We want to be as transparent as possible in the preface to our works about the purpose of our book or our project and its process, including cultural accountability. In addition, we want to keep in mind that the moment that we're in right now, that we want our works to have longevity. It would be great for the works that are being made now to still be able to be read 10 years from now and still be considered uh, works that everyone is going to feel good about and that everyone is going to feel like are really respectful from an intercultural standpoint. 
So our accountability is not just to our students now, but also to our students of the future. And finally, as teachers of language and interculturality, we want to recognize our role as allies. We're allies in the dismantling of historic and current systems of oppression. This is a movement that's been going on for so long, led mostly by Black and Indigenous people of color. And we who are white or who identify with uh, forces that have been aligned with oppression, we're being called to be allies in this movement toward liberation. And the liberation really leads toward the liberation for all of us. So we as a world language profession have this amazing opportunity to, to put forth our own grain of sand toward this very broad worldwide movement. So we're almost, we're almost finished. As new generations of writers honor principles of own voices in their writing, their works will be widely read because this is what students, teachers, and community members are seeking. So again, I want to repeat this phrase that we, we really like, when we know better, we do better. There is not place in here to say, oh, but this person wrote this or this person wrote that and I'm going to repeat it and say it again. When we know better, we do better. So at this point, we are learning, reflecting about these practices so we know better. There is a call for us to do better. And there is a big movement, uh, own voices movement for the writing um, of their own stories. So the idea of this project is to uplift each other. We need each other's voices. We do need each other's voices. It's not, as a Colombian, I don't want my white author friends to stop writing. I need their stories and I need their voices so bad, the same way they need mine. So this is, don't stop writing, keep writing, just write your stories. You give me your stories, I give you mine. And then our classroom libraries are going to be so pretty, full of beautiful windows and mirrors that are 100% accurate and that can help our students to really see the human humanity behind the characters of those books. My students, um, mo none of my students are Latino. My students are white, uh, Asian, East Indian. So I need mirrors for them. I cannot write those stories because those are not my voices. So I need my other friend authors to give me those stories. And when you need windows to Latino countries and cultures, specifically Colombian, I can open those windows and invite you into my house and we can have a tintico together and I share my stories with you. So this is just to, to help each other building beautiful stories for our classroom libraries. Thank you, Adriana, for that conclusion. And some next steps as we go forward. Where do we go from here? We strongly encourage everyone to read the full, the full document, Writing Toward the Acquisition of Respectful Interculturality, which explores these themes in much greater detail. That full document, which really is a book, is available on our Facebook page. Our Facebook page is the name of this project called Staying in Our Lanes. And you can also follow the project on social media. Our hashtag on Twitter is Staying Our Lanes. You'll notice that in is not in there because Twitter has a limit of characters. And on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us at Staying in Our Lanes. And again, the full book is called Writing Toward the Acquisition of Respectful Interculturality. And you can find that at those places. Thank you everyone for watching this webinar. We are really excited to hear your feedback and comments. So please do go on our social media and let us know. Um, and we can't wait to continue the conversation and we continue growing together. Au revoir, goodbye.